Welcome back to Friday Hacks. So today we are very excited to invite uh, Xue Yao to present um, stuff about core boot custom laptops. Okay, so yes. over to you. Uh, first, I must apologize for wearing a mask because I'm feeling like really bad these few days. So um, anyways, so um, I'm Xue Yao and uh, I'll be doing a presentation on uh, core boot and custom laptops. Um, okay. So this is like the overview of what I'm going to do. Uh, you can ignore most of it because uh, this is like for posterity if you ever like want to view it back. But anyways, all right. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm really just a hobbyist. I'm not a dev. Uh, I'm not from CS. So this is actually my first time in uh, NUS Hackers as well. <laughs> it's my first time attending, <laughs> ironically, as a presenter. But yeah, so this is what I do. Um, I built custom laptops. Uh, yeah, so um, you'll hear about it at the end because uh, I was told to like present more about the technical stuff. So there's no notification. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was told to present more on the technical stuff. So I won't like talk much about what I'm doing as like, uh, like building custom laptops. Huh? But yeah, so um, I'm graduating in December. Um, I took a get semester to work on stuff. So soon to be unemployed. Yeah, like. I assume half of you here. <laughs> All right, so first we'll talk about this guy. Do you guys know about him? <laughs> no, he's the guy who built uh, GNU. So he's like the other side of the coin of Linux. You know, when you write Linux, it's... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He got, he got um, I think he didn't get kicked. He was suspended from MIT. Cause yeah, cause he made some like weird. Oh, is it? Okay, I... Yeah, I think he was suspended for everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this guy's a little weird, but um, we don't care about what, you know, he's doing now. We care about what his philosophy is. So um, he, he founded FSF, which is Free Software Foundation. And um, he's the guy who wrote GNU. So um, when you install Linux, right, it's actually GNU slash Linux, or like what he puts it, GNU plus Linux. <laughs> yeah, okay, so... Uh, yeah, so they, they have a kernel as well, but um, it's, it's pretty trashy. That kernel is really, yeah. I mean, he, he tried to build a kernel, but it kind of failed. So everybody is just doing both at the same time. So yeah, so this guy, he, he's, um, he also wrote GPL. Um, I, I assume most of you have heard, I've heard of GPL, right? If you haven't, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, no, GPL, GPL license. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you, when you, when like you, you know, you need a, you need a git and, and you need to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to define it. So he's the guy who, uh, who wrote the first two or three versions. I can't remember, but yeah. So he's the guy who founded all these things. And his philosophy is that, um, he wants things to be free as in freedom, not, not free as in free as in no money. Cause you can actually charge money for free software, believe it or not, you can. So he's the, he's the reason why a lot of our things are, like great, like Linux, right? It's it. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> so Linux is great. So he used uh, Linux uses GPL as the version as the license. So uh, the main thing I'm talking about is that his philosophy is that we want things to be free as in freedom. Free as in no strings attached. Yes, as no strings attached. So means no warranty as well, So if you blow up a laptop, you know, I, I have done that before. So yeah, um, just be careful. All right. Okay. So to the more technical stuff. Um, just as an introduction, what's a firmware? Because Core Boot is a firmware, right? So firmware is like, a, like it's written there. It's, it's the first thing that you see. So you know when you turn on a laptop or a computer and you see a Boot logo? Yeah, that's your firmware. So if you guys don't know what it is, that's, that's the thing. And it's an in independent piece of software. So if you ever like remove your hard drive and you know, whatever else, don't, don't remove your RAM, but if you remove your hard drive, you'll still be able to see a Boot logo. It just tell you no hard drive. So if you ever wondered like, where that is, right, or what that is, that is the firmware. And that's the thing we're gonna talk about. Um, what else? Yeah, so it's the first piece of the code, uh, first piece of code that the CPU executes. So it's hard coded to execute from like this address. So that's, that's, that's the crux of a firmware of a computer. And for computers, right, the firmware is actually located on the SPI chip. So um, I, I will tear down my, like, my thing that later, um, if time permits. And it's a tiny chip that you can write and read from. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's very small. It's one meg to 16 megs. 
I mean, okay, 16 max you think is small, right? Because you know you can um you can like one image can be like 10 max if you have a DSLR. But I will show you later what you can achieve on like 4 max, which is pretty damn cool. So um yeah, okay, next. So uh before we go more on to it, I just want to talk about this thing because um I think it's slightly relevant or maybe less relevant than everything else, but BIOS and UEFI, right? It's actually two different things. So when you when you if you ever like install stuff and ask you, oh, you want to install, sorry, if you install an OS and you want to install, and they'll ask you whether you want like BIOS or UEFI, yeah, that's what it's talking about. And it's a misnomer because uh BIOS is actually the uh what we call the older version, like the the, the old stuff. So um yeah, so you can you can read it. Um am I blocking the screen? Should I sit down? Should I try sit down? All right, all right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um the BIOS, right? It's it's actually from like a long time ago. We from the 8086 and um it's from like 40, 50 years ago. So it's very, very old, but it's very simple. It's like, it's very, very short. So, and we had like decades of um, engineering um, expertise put into it. So I guess, well, I mean, it is it is what it is. And the pros is that it's very small and it has a lot of experience. I mean, a lot of expertise on it, but that's its cons as well. So it's, it's very, very old and it's got like legacy code all over it. So imagine like when you had like, 512k of RAM, you know, so that's that's from that era or even before that. So that's BIOS. And now we have the shiny new UEFI, which is what we are, or not what we are, but it's what what we install as modern OS now. I mean, it's not that modern. It was released like less than a decade ago. And most OS still supports uh, MVR, which is BIOS. So UEFI, it's, it's shinier, it's nicer, it's newer, but it's got a lot of problems. So its pros and cons are the same as well because it's so new. It's got a lot of like holes. It's it's like Swiss cheese. So, uh, I, yeah. So you'll see later that um that there's a group of people who actually likes uh, BIOS standard as a standard. Anyways, I'm talking too much because this this is not like super relevant. But anyways, so why Corbu? Because <clears throat> why not, right? Some Google engineer was like. You know what? Let's build our own open source firmware. Cause why the hell not? Cause that's what Google does. So, but it's Google, and well, you know they're evil now. So, ew, no. Okay, and um, you can learn stuff, but that's 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 you know what? That's that's up to you, right? So, and that's not cool. So, it's open sourced. Um, if you if you haven't guessed by now, it's fully open. You can you can fuck the thing yourself. FORK fork the thing yourself, and um, you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, you you can. So you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's like there's like a lot of derivatives, but we're gonna talk about the main family, which is Corbu. Uh, it's maintained by mostly by Google, but there's a lot of like freelancers working on it as well, and like random PRs. I've submitted PRs before, and um, it's pretty interesting, I guess. And um. The most important thing about this is that it removes useless vendor codes. So if you ever launch like not ThinkPads, but like a more generic brand or smaller brand, you'll see you'll see that it says like a AMI BIOS or um I think Megatrend. That's so those BIOS, right, is licensed from these companies. So these companies build BIOSes and you license it from them and use their SDK to build your own BIOS. But like, what's the point, right? There's no point in getting them because you're working with like Intel stuff or AMD if you're an AMD guy. So we remove that. We basically cut them off and we just use like Intel's blobs directly. So you can use their Intel's whatever you want. And the most important thing about it is that as a vendor or as a manufacturer, you won't be able to maintain a bias for the next five to six years. ThinkPads are exceptions. MacBooks are exceptions. But your general like... um. Your like your gaming laptops, they won't last for they won't have like BIOS updates for more than two years. And you'll get like Spectre and some other like um like a lot of a lot of random stuff that could happen or like uh exploits and um problems that can happen. So that's a more important thing, right? You can maintain your own BIOS. And um and the thing is, right, all the laptops, or rather the laptops that um that I enjoy are more than 10 years old. And I can update it by myself. I can patch whatever I want and I can I can build on it whatever however I want, however I want. Because BIOS is ultimately the hardware abstraction layer. So um, just as an example, um, 
laptops before 2014 generally do not have NVMe ports, if you don't know. NVMe is a new standard of uh, SSDs. NVMe uses uh, PCIe lanes, which is the connection that they, uh, which is the connection type. And PCIe's, well, but the thing is PCIe's have existed long before, since like 2006 or something. So what you could do with these BIOS is that you could install them on a 2010 laptop and put a NVMe drive on it, off it. And you get like, well, it's marginally faster than SATA, but you could do that. So it's one of the few things that you can do along with like a lot of other cool things that you can do, but let's not talk about it for now. And um, yeah, so, and also you look like a hacker man and you know, you get a show up to end I'm presenting here, right? Okay, so, all right, next thing. This one is the part that, um, that we, that I actually um, care more about, which is the privacy concerns behind um, Intel chips. Um, so it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So every single CPUs, yeah, yeah, they have, they have, they have. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, Intel, they, they install a thing called Intel Management Engine on every laptop since 2010, or, or rather every computer since 2009 slash 2010. And that is a coprocessor inside your computer that runs 24 seven, even with, okay, so it doesn't run with power, it, it doesn't run without power, obviously, but as long as you plug it in, even your main OS is off, it will, uh, it will turn on. It has its own RAM, it has its own everything, it runs on the background, it has direct access to your gigabit ethernet, and um, new, wi new laptops, right, they have Wi-Fi soldered on, it has direct access to Wi-Fi as well. In short, it's NSA's backdoor to everything that, yeah, yeah, I'm not even kidding, man. So the thing is, right, there was some, somebody actually saw a leak, well, not leak, but like a glitched version of Dell's website where they provided, enabled a uh, US military to buy laptops with the ME turn off. So the US military knows that it's, it's a backdoor. So, uh, cause, cause you, cause you think it's backdoor, right? But I think the biggest concern, it's not just the attack. You talk about the new exploits, right? Like what, what, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, like you said, right? So no, if, uh, yeah, if, if there's ever an exploit to, um, to management engine, well, your laptop is basically screwed. And it, it has like ring like negative three or something, like basically ridiculously low level. It has direct access to your RAM. So even if you encrypt your shit, right, you will, you will get decrypted because it's on the RAM. <laughs> so don't think you can exit and like, like, like leave from it. So I, I guess that's what like Apple is trying to do because they switched to ARM. They were like, nah, I'm not going to use Intel and like their, their junk. So they started using that. But the concern is more of like, the time we have the portal is Yeah, I mean, that, that as well, that as well, of course. So, I mean, I mean, that was a joke, right? So, Apple was doing their own thing. And, um, it's not, on the, no, this is not on the TPM, this is on the chipset. This is on the PCH. So, the, so like, on, on the picture, right, it's, it's literally here. This is your CPU. If it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is a CPU chip. So, if you ever tear down a laptop and you look at it, you'll look something like this with two chips on it. And you're going to like, what is this? Well, this is the PCH. But then again, it contains everything else that spies on you. And you cannot remove it because it's embedded in a PCH. PCH is like, it's like, it's like the glue to your CPU. It, it, it holds your communications and everything else. So you need your USB. Yeah, it comes from PCH. You need your, I think, um, PCI comes from PCH as well. So everything is on the PCH. And ME has direct access. So um, this thing is, this thing is like a terror. So, I mean, of course, we're all like, like, like normal people, so we probably don't care about it. But I'm just telling you that this thing exists. So, okay. And it controls everything. Like I said, it has direct access to RAM. That's, that's like ridiculously dangerous. It has direct access to a gigabit ethernet. So even if home's home, you can't tell. You can't, you can't really tell. I mean, you, you could probably tell, but if you home's home to like, to like Intel, right? You, you don't know what's like, what it's doing. It could be just Windows doing updates. Sorry? Does it have drivers for every single brand of network interface card? I mean, most of the time you're using Intel's... Yeah, but if I it's like some other... Yeah, like yeah, yeah, then it probably doesn't, doesn't have access, la. but I'm talking about most laptops, because, well, everyone here uses a laptop. If nobody here, if somebody here don't use a laptop, please tell me, because... Isn't that the campus concern? It's just a subsystem that controls everything in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, right, okay, so ME, right, what it could do, what, what, okay, what Intel says it does, right, is that it helps you init your, like, RAM and stuff, but the thing is, right, we found out it doesn't really do, okay, it does do that, but we don't need it to do that. 
And um, there's people who actually removed the entire ME, like the, the, the blob, the firmware. And it, it turns out that the system can run, it can boot. After, after half an hour, the thing will shut down. So Intel has set a, like a hard switch to just shut down if it doesn't detect any management engine. Or like you remove the uh, software. No, you, you run for half an hour and shut down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you, if you look it up, right, more than half of the Wikipedia is on like exploits. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous and nobody cares because, well, like, I don't know why, but nobody cares. So, and um, no, uh, AMD doesn't help you either because AMD has its own thing. It's called AMD PSP. We're not, about, we're not gonna talk about it because I have, I have no idea what it is, but yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Okay, so, so um, b before that, right, you need to know what, it, what it's meant for. This is designed for enterprises to remotely manage their machines. So let's say your laptop has some issues, you bring it home, or like you're traveling, like on a business trip, suddenly it like, it like shuts down. You're like, how do I fix this? Then you go to a hotel, you plug into a land, somebody like on the other side of the earth can, can, can like manage your laptop. That's what it was designed for, but no home users need this. Like, we don't need this, I don't need this. Like, do you even know what it is? You don't, because you don't need it. No, 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 it, it, it doesn't go through its own channel. You have to like allow it to update. But anyways, okay, so next part. Um, okay, so this is the more technical stuff. Uh, for the BIOS, right? <clears throat> because it's a, it's, a, it's a whole block, or rather it's like a, it's like a eight meg or four meg firmware. So Intel has defined what, what, what it looks like, and it looks like this. Uh, you can take a look at it yourself. This is very, very boring, but I thought I need to put it here because you need to know that this, there's a structure to it. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so there's a structure to it. Um, so it will go to the, F, it, it's called Intel uh, FIT. You can look it up next time yourself, but it defines how the actual chip is laid out. So it doesn't care like what BIOS you're running, whatever. It, it defines how the chip is laid out. So we'll talk about, uh, you, you'll see later. So um, when, you, when, you, when you dump the entire format out and you run it through a tool, uh, that actually can tell you the, the information, you'll see that it actually tells you these things. So Intel, uh, so the first part is the firm flash descriptor, second part is BIOS, third part is the management engine, and the fourth part is the gigabit ethernet. So these are the components in a typical BIOS, like BIOS as in the entire firmware itself. This is what it comprises of. And um, so as you can see, the management engine firmware is inside there. It's, it's actually here for easy updates, now, but who knows, right? Maybe like five years later, they decide to integrate it directly inside the, the, the PCH. So for now, we can actually like play around with it, but in the future, we can't anymore. So for now, we can. So um, interestingly enough, there's also Gigabit Ethernet, which is the Intel's NIC. It's also as a, it's also a firmware, it's also a part of the firmware. Yeah, and some other stuff, but these are the highlights. Of course, the most important part is the BIOS. So like I said, right, it's a misnomer that that BIOS refers to the entire thing, but actually the, it, it's entirely called firmware and the BIOS refers to a part of it. So, sorry? It's some other like stuff, it's like some init stuff, like some other, like, yeah, you can, you can look it up. Uh, you can look it up Intel FIT. There's like a hundred page document on it if you're if you ever curious. Yeah, you, you could, you could. So, um, and um, part of the BIOS, right, is core boot itself. So core boot actually exists on a BIOS portion, not on the entire firmware. So like I said, it's a misnomer. So th that's why I actually spent one slide talking about this misnomer, because if not, you guys would be very confused on what the hell is going on. So core boot is actually a part of the BIOS and core boot itself has its own defined um, layout, its own defined system and its own definition of everything. So what is cool about core boot is that you can install your own payloads. So, you know, normally when you turn on a computer and you can choose your, I mean, if you ever do, you can choose your boot device. You can like, if you have a desktop computer, you can change your clock and whatever. Yeah, so that's that's one like app application on the uh, on 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 the UFI firmware. So what Cobra does is allows you to augment this entire thing. So it allows you to deploy on payload, which includes this. You can ignore the first two because you probably won't know what it is. You can deploy on Grub. Yeah, you can, so, so you can deploy Grub2 on it. That means that you can boot directly to Grub. I don't know if you understand what this means. It means that you skip like the boot logo, you just see Grub directly, which is pretty damn cool. And from there, you can actually chain load another, like your, your own hard drive's Grub. So that means that you like skip 
well, most of the things in the middle. So later I can show you what, what's going on. Like. And the coolest thing is that you can run Linux on it. That means that you can, <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, right, because we are here, and use hackers. So you can run Linux on a 16 Mac chip, or on this laptop, it's 12 Macs, or later you'll see it's actually 4 Macs. And I have not one, but like a couple of Linux. Oh, it's like Linux itself. No, it's Linux inside a small chip on your computer. There's no hard drive on it. I can show you, I can, I can dismantle it and remove the hard drives, and you'll see that I can still put Linux on it. Of course, it's rudimentary, and you probably see only a shell, but it's, it's pretty damn cool, you know? So this is what you can do, and you can define whatever you want on it. And um, okay, so uh, some demo stuff, uh, just to give you guys more perspective, right? Um, okay, so I need to switch this. Yeah, okay, so okay, so just, just now what has okay, I think you guys, some of you know what's Tiano call. Uh. It's a, it's a UFI firmware that is available on um, QEMU. If you guys have ever charged QEMU, you'll see it booting with you'll see it booting, right? Because it looks like a machine. So I'm gonna do that on a real machine. And then you will like think, wow, that's cool, but actually, yeah, so <laughs> um, okay, let me figure out how to use this. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, this is a schematics of this laptop that I have over there. It's got a T440P from, uh, it's a ThinkPad. It's from, it's from a long time ago, it's from 2014. Well, not really long time, but it's relatively long ago compared to your new modern netbooks and stuff. And this is a schematic of it. So um, uh, just disclaimer, Lenovo, don't sue me because this thing is, well, I found it on the line, but anyways. Yeah, okay, so these things are not supposed to be online, lah, but you know what, it's China, you know, so. It's, it's made in China, so. Yeah, okay. So you can see the entire like schematic here, but I would like to point to, um, where is it? Okay, so you can, you, you can see the RAM here, and you can see like miscellaneous and other stuff. Uh, let me find, where is it? Uh, SPI. Oh. Yeah, there, there's, there's 99 pages because, well, it's difficult to build a laptop. And also, this is considered very nice because they label everything. If you go and look up some random laptop, right, you won't, you'll find like, like some of them don't even have proper schematic, like no labeling, nothing. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Ah, there we go. 12, page 12. Yeah. Page. Is this it? Nope. PCH. Yeah, okay, so uh, so the uh, chips are actually look are actually connected here. Let me see if I can actually find the chips. Ah there we go. Okay. So wait, is it this one? Yeah, okay, great. So this is the actual chip that contains your firmware. It's literally a chip. And you can see it has eight legs. And if you know what it is, it's SPI. So I will tear it down later and just show you guys. But just to give you a perspective, right? Because if you think it's like very far away, no, it's just a chip on your laptop or your, on your computer. And it's a chip on every single computer out there. It's an SPI chip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'll see it, you'll see it. It's, it's not, it, it, uh, this is separate, and I'll show you guys later. I'll FaceTime myself and like, yeah, you'll see here. <laughs> okay, so sorry, back to the presentation. Can you share the document? <laughs> <laughs> it's illegal. Google it yourself, but it's very simple to find. You'll probably find it. Okay, okay so, uh, okay, I'll tear it out. Uh, FaceTime myself first. Okay, so, um, yeah, apologies for the very weird setup. I didn't ask about the visualizer. <laughs> Okay, so this is, um, yeah, okay, so this thing pad, right? Um, this chip is right here. It's actually very exposed right here. Yeah, I don't know, okay, do, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's right here. Yeah, it's right here. So it's, uh, it's literally an SPI chip. And uh, I'm not gonna show it right now because this thing will take forever, but you can literally use, you can use this and this. Let me just grab it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can use this to yeah to clip it on the uh, BIOS chip, and you can dump the entire firmware. Right. Yeah. Directly. So this is how you literally dump firmware from laptops and in general like devices. Yeah. So. Sorry. Uh. Yeah. 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 So of course. So uh. This is what it looks like, and um. Yeah, so this is a laptop and uh well it's not a very very like massive tear down, but this is what it is. And um oh yeah, yeah, but uh you can you can actually install Cobble yourself. So on this laptop, I have Cobble on it with TNO core. So hopefully you can see it in action. Do you mind? Yes. Okay. And there's no power. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, this laptop hasn't died on me. Yeah, um, have you guys seen this? So this is, uh, if you ever use QEmail, you would, you will see this. And um, I'm literally running, well, QEmail, right? But it's actually TNO core. So this is a UEFI firmware. And I'm going to boot from it. I'm going to boot um, Debian on it because uh, I'm going to show it. Um, the thumb drive is not for anything. Um, my bootloader is good. So it's kind of not working well right now. So I'm just going to use this to help me boot from, um, from my hard drive from my disk. The hard drive is here, by the way. Yeah. So if you guys haven't torn down a laptop before. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very old laptop. It doesn't have M2. Um, I mean, it could. Yeah. 24. It could have an M2, but yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm going to give you a very weird booting because my uh, my boot my boot loader is kind of screwed right now, so I'm just gonna I'm using a thumb drive to help me boot. Um, okay. No, yeah, it's a it's a portable boot loader. Okay. Yeah, so it's great it's if like you ever. It? Yeah, it, it's just grub, but it's like a pimp top grub. It's like 300 max. I I don't know why it's 300 max, but it's a 300 max grub. Yeah, if you guys ever wanna like 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 screw up these things, right? It, it's very cool, but it's also very very big. I don't know why. It's yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> all right, okay, okay. So, um, apologies for the super long boot, but <laughs> all right, okay. So, let's do it directly, okay. Uh, yeah, so if you guys realize there's nothing different about this laptop compared to a normal, normal uh, thing, but except that it's running a uh, open source firmware, so everything from the ground up except Intel stuff is open source because I'm running Debian, right? So, everything is technically open source, which is Pretty nice. The, the newer laptops don't allow you to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you, you can't, you can't screw up. It's okay. So I'm gonna. <coughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I have another. I have another um copy of. So uh, you guys saw just now that I was running Tiano Core, right? So I'm gonna flash another BIOS right now with another payload on it. What? Yeah, so I'm gonna do it right now, and you guys can see it's uh, it's pretty cool. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna run this command, and it's gonna like flash the uh, BIOS directly in. Yeah, so it's flashing in BIOS right now. So if you guys have ever like flash BIOSes before on a desktop, it may look like this. It may ask you to like install flash ROM and type in some random commands. Well, now you know it's just writing to SPI chip on a on, on your machine. And um, flash ROM can write to any well any device that is like you can write to any chip basically. So it supports the 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 the, the, the SPI reader thing as well. You're gonna use the same software. Yeah. Normal BIOSes unlocked. No, no, no. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so it's verified, it's done. So I'm going to I'm gonna shut it down right now. And um, you'll see that it comes out to some other stuff that you'll think it's, wow, it's cool. But uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Rambling a little bit. <clears throat> well. Man to Tetris, my own Tetris in the box. Okay, so let's run. Okay, so this is uh, CBIOS. It's but it's BIOS, so it's not UEFI. So this thing that cannot boot my Debian, cannot boot anything basically. It's very old, but if you but it's very secure, supposedly. It's more secure than UEFI. 
So if you guys actually want to like play around with this, uh, C bio is pretty cool. So I'm going to run number seven. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, and, the, and, the, and okay, you guys don't know what it means, right? It means that I'm running this directly off the BIOS chip. I will pull out my hard drive right now and show you guys. Okay, so uh, always unplug your power because if you do, don't do that, you're going to burn something. Uh, I'm going to... So there's no other hidden drives on this. Um, well, I have no reason to lie to you, right? How do you know you don't have the option not want to share your device? Sorry? I mean, that is kind of like an option wrong, but I don't have any PCI device on this. This is a laptop. So I'm going to remove the hard drive. Yeah, it's a, it's a two and a half inch. So uh, there's no other drives on it. Lah. Yeah, okay. And uh, I'm going to just plug it in right now. Okay, and... And we're going to play with something else called this thing. Okay. What? Yeah, okay. So this is a full um, Linux with GUI running on a, on a BIOS chip. The BIOS chip is 4 megs. But I've got like eight other stuff in there. So this is a full GUI and um, you can... Well, you have shell, so so like 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 I said, right? There's there's nothing here. There's no hard drive. There's, there's no other hidden things in there. You can examine it later yourself. I don't mind. This thing is well quite old, so I don't really care if you break it. But of course, don't don't break it. But yeah, so this is this is running off off a very tiny chip, and it load it loaded the entire OS onto the RAM. So that loaded in like like two seconds. So yeah, you had you can technically have a full. Linux on it, and you can run, you can have network, you, you, you can have networking. I, yeah, so you can, but I'm not going to figure out how to, how to work it, but you could, you could, and you have like other stuff like Flappy Bird. That's, okay, I died. Yeah, so this thing is running off a BIOS chip. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, that's all for the live presentation. You can play around with it later if you want. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can, you can actually do that. You could, so uh, you can buy like a 128 meg chip and you can technically load a, like a proper Linux, like a more proper, you can compile the, the kernel yourself and you know, you can remove all the junk, but you could have a more proper Linux uh, running on a BIOS chip with no hard drives. I don't know what's the purpose for it, but you know, you could, because uh, and you as hackers, right? I mean, I already did this, which is kind of pointless, but yeah, you could. So. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, you could, but it's easier to just bring a thumb drive, right? So, um, it's just something to show you that Corvo could do anything, and um, so these things are com uh, are are exported as uh, floppy disk images, and you can export, you can like install any floppy disk images inside there, and you can, you can you can run it. Yeah. So like like I just show you, I flap like Flappy Bird and a full Linux. There's a couple of homebrew OS on it as well, uh, due to type. I, I don't think you can run Doom, but uh, um, well, welcome to try. Um, yeah, but it's big enough, I think, right? Yeah, you can compress it and it probably runs on it. So you could. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is, uh, this is a very, very rough rundown on it. Okay, so back to the presentation. Oh, oh. I mean, it, uh, Grub, Grub takes in the config file, so you can, so you can, so you can, so you can, so you can try or whatever. And you're good off it. So what most people do if they actually run this setup, right, is that they will load grub as a payload and then load it a very simple config for you to chain load another config that exists on your actual hard drive. So you could technically pull that off and um, it boots very fast, but there is no practical purpose behind it lah, other than like just being cool and showing off. This one like, is, is different, right? The yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. Okay, so, sorry, yeah. This is like for kernel development, you usually debug it using QEMU, right? But then for this one, you what what what's the debugging process like? Crashes of this this one. You're just not boot if it crashes, but if it but if it doesn't boot, right? You can ask it to write a log into your into a, into SPI chip. Is there like uh, what what debugging tools are there? So uh, for conventional laptops, you can 
Okay, so uh, if you didn't catch his question, how do you debug this thing if it doesn't boot, right? Yeah, in short, you don't because it just doesn't boot. <laughs> so you just pray, right? It just pray. But no, 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 that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the brute force way. So you don't do that. You can ask it to write a log into the SPI chip and then you read from it. So the, I can tell you, right, for, for a fact that the most painful thing you ever do, right, is clipping on the damn chip for like 20 times and it doesn't work because that thing is so small. So a lot of people, a lot of like online people, they, what they do, right, is that they will solder eight wires on it because it's so painful to, to clip on a damn thing on, on, a small, on a small chip. So you could do that. And there's some, and there's some like special uh, debugging uh, interfaces that I, if I know it goes to a USB, but I've not explored that before. So in general, you just write it, ask it to write the logs to SPI. Yeah, the SPI is super endurable, don't worry. Um, it endures, it can write like more than your SSD, so it's fine. Anyways, uh, ME cleaner, yes, okay. So, uh, okay, you know what, uh, I didn't demo this. And um, you know what, it's fine, uh, okay. So, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll skip this part because we don't have enough time, right? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Um, okay, in short, right, Coreboot can clean out ME as well, the management engine. So for, uh, there's some guy online who's like super smart, he wrote a script that cleans out the entire management engine or rather like 90% of it. And you can run it alongside with Coreboot. So I can show you right now where you compile it, what it, oh, oh, oh no, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can neuter it. So you can when, when you compile it, it's super easy to compile. It's a, it's it's literally just a sixteen meg. Right? It's it's smaller than that, right? So if you want to like play around with it, you can. So under chipsets, you can scroll down, blah, blah blah blah, and you can strip down the ME firmware, and by that you can and tear down the entire for or not tear down, but tear down most of it. So you can have a peace of mind when if you want to like run secret stuff on it. Yeah. Um. So you could do that. And you can like do some other stuff, la, but in general, the, this menu doesn't provide a lot of options, but you can like, uh, let me see what other stuff, what other cool stuff is there. Yeah, so you can, so the microcodes, you can, you can get the latest microcode yourself. It literally just generates from, uh, from Intel's um, uh, repo. So that's what I mean. You abstract away, or rather you, you, remove, you remove all the vendor stuff and you do everything yourself and you interact directly with Intel. So you get the best of everything. La. So. Sorry, PCH. Yeah, PCH. yeah uh, okay, so I mean, the, the I mean, uh, removal, right, you will do that. So you, you, you will remove like 80% of it. Right, okay, so this is a very quick demo. Uh, okay, where is it? Okay, okay, so that was supposedly the cool shenanigan stuff. Yeah, okay, so uh, just to talk a little bit about the management engine in Core Boot. Um, for newer laptops, right, it's very difficult to pull it off, or almost impossible, because um, for security purposes, Intel's or rather the, the, the vendor signs all their firmware and literally burn it on the chip. So you are unable to install your own custom firmware at all for future, uh, unless you know the vendor, which uh, in that case, you have to be the vendor, which I'll talk about in a, in a little while. So you could, uh, you could technically pull it off, but it's more difficult. So you have no peace of mind in the future. Well, except, okay, so... So you, by now you'll be wondering, right, what's the point of Coreboot in terms of what Google wants it, right? So Coreboot runs on every Chromebook out there. So technically every Chromebook has an open source firmware and technically an open source OS, but it's Google. So, you know, don't be evil, right? But yeah, you could do that. So that's the kind of the future where it's not a very, um, where it's not very friendly to hackers anymore. You could, you could technically pull it off with, Specialized laptops that um that well, I built. <laughs> so okay, that's that was a nice segue. So uh, <coughs> so I built um custom laptops. Um, the image on the left is uh the same laptop as the image uh, as as the laptop on the right, except that I removed the I, I installed a custom panel on it, and I replaced the keyboard and some other stuff in it. So um, I mean, if you want to have like a like a very secure laptop that you can build yourself. And also have better hardware, you could do that. And um, the after the, the aftermarket display, right? It doesn't hook on the uh, default um, display bus. So what it does is it um, then that the, there's an adapter for it that you can actually um, uh, bring out the display port um, connection, and then you can bring it into the new display. So in short, you are jerry rigging this thing, but it's a very nice jerry rig. So yeah, with 3D printed parts and all, and um. What okay, so I, I actually went to Shenzhen for about for okay, not Shenzhen, but I went to China and went to Shenzhen and like 
Um, if you guys don't know, it's the largest electronics market in the world. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, I went there, you know, I, I talked to like uh, vendors and uh, suppliers and stuff. And uh, it's a very, very interesting journey, I guess. Um, if you guys never been there, you should once China opens up to, to tourists. It's very, very cool. Uh, it's 24-7 and like you can buy anything you want. Yeah, it's 24-7. You can buy anything you want. You can literally buy whatever, buy whatever you want. If you want a RAM, you can go there right now and buy one. If you want like this CMOS or, or whatever, right? If you want a CPU, you can buy it. You can literally buy CPUs, laptop CPUs that are diesel, that they are ready for you in bulk. Like if you want like a thousand chips right now, within an hour, you go there, you tell them, I want a thousand chips right now in an hour and they'll tell you the price. They won't tell you they can't do it. They'll just tell you the price. <laughs> yeah. And the price is usually like dirt cheap because it's China, right? So... <clears throat> Sorry. So <clears throat> um, what I've been doing recently is I've been um, upgrading older laptops. So I've, uh, yeah, so this was a laptop from 2010. And um, I just like, I work with vendors and I work with different people to produce a 2020 motherboard. So it's an entirely different motherboard. In short, you, I'm just using a chassis and um, the motherboard is completely different. So it has a 3K display, uh, Jerry rigged as well. <laughs> Um, and as a 3D printed port by it, so you will have you will have you will get a USB C as well. So it's a 2010 laptop brought into 2020. It's pretty, it's a pretty cool sleeper PC, I guess. If you guys aren't into ThinkPads, but yes, this is this is what I, I could do. And you can put in like 64 gigs of RAM on this. And this is from like 2010. So if you ever like, yeah, yeah, you I I, I used to run 64 gigs of RAM, but that was way overkill, man. Don't don't nobody needs six, 64 gigs. Yeah, I don't understand why the 16 gig RAM on phones, but yes. Okay. And um, yeah, that's, wait, I think that was a slide. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So, sorry, yeah, okay. I guess that slide was screwed up. Uh, this is my workshop in China. I work with my uncle to produce laptops. He builds, he builds. I tell him how to like go about it. Because I'm not in China, as you can see, if you, if you can't tell. So, so. So he built, uh, he, 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 he does the hands-on and I do all the software and, um, and all the like tutorial and stuff. And I get him to do all the things. And if I need to buy, if I need to, if I need to like um, get stuff, like get parts and whatever, I'll do it. Or I'll ask my uncle to do it. And um, they will just ship directly to his, to his, um, to, 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 to our workshop in China. Yeah. So you can technically run a small um, modding business with, with literally no screwdrivers. On you. I mean, I, I do, but that's that's because I brought it, right? So usually I don't bring a screwdriver around with me. So you could do this. And um, yeah, so I've been doing this for a couple of years. I have a website if you guys are interested. So this is this is my info. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I mean, you, you could do that and you can, we can like... Is there any sense to that? Because I might actually no, buy one. No, no, but um, <laughs> if you can, if you can invest hundred thousand, then you know we'll get it done. We'll get it done, man. Of course, yeah. <laughs>
currently. Um, so essentially, what we have is these uh, pneumatic actuators that inflate, and you can feel um, impact uh, in places around your body, similar to Ready Player One. I, I see some faces, you know. It's a half the glass, yeah. Right, I know, <laughs> yeah. Um, so essentially, we are kind of doing the same thing. We're just doing it with pneumatics. Um, and we like to think of ourselves as like the really Lego of haptic interfaces. So we have a suite of technologies. This is just one of them. Um, and we're combining them in order to create this modular platform where you can do a lot more things than just like full body haptics. Um, but that's not the topic of today's talk for me. Um, what we're going to see is the hard things about running a hardware company. So essentially, when it comes to hardware, uh, there's a few challenges that come into play. Uh, and the first section, I'm going to mostly talk about that. It's why is, why is hardware hard? Um, then in the second section, I'm going to talk about uh, hardware cold start hacks because essentially the most difficult thing with any hardware company is to get it off the ground. Um, once you get the momentum, things become easier, um, as with any company, but specifically with hardware companies because your competitors now have the same challenges to come into play that you had when you started off. And then the third one, I'm going to like briefly touch over like some business models that some hardware companies use if we have time. Um, but the first two parts are probably the most important. Probably the second part is the most important. Um, so why is hardware like really, really hard? So if you are familiar with like Eric Reese's concept of the lean startup, it's, it's quite simple. It's you have an idea or a hypothesis. What you do is you build um, something that allows you to either prove or disprove that hypothesis. right? Um, that's your initial product. You ship the product, and what you do is you measure um, how it's doing. So it can be subjective metrics like uh, customer feedback, or it can be objective metrics like um, data, like raw hard data. Like let's say it's a software app. It's data could be something like how often uh, do people log into the app, how many people do they have in the network, stuff like that, right? And essentially, what you do is you learn from that, uh, and then you fix whatever is broken, right? And the whole idea is um, you want to go through this loop as fast and as often as possible so that you get closer to product market fit, essentially. So it's like having a product which most people want to use. And in terms of software, uh, funnily enough, pizza. So um, essentially, basically, like, Lean software cycle, the way I look at it is you have a bunch of coders. Uh, your fuel is pizza and coffee, and your output is code, right? So I mean, we've been through that cycle for, for a pretty long time. I think pretty much everyone here is familiar with it. So with software, it's easier to ship this product, measure using data metrics, which you can take in from your software itself, learn. You go back, you discuss with your team what's wrong, if there is like a glaring issue, you apply a patch. If there is, you know, if you if your product is like closer to like getting fit, it it'll probably be more like a feature request or a feature improvement, um, and you can go through this loop pretty quickly because you can push the product out quite fast. Now, when you try doing this with hardware, the main issue that happens is you have this initial prototype, and then you still have to have like a software layer on top because in, in today's era, you very rarely find hardware which doesn't have software because it has to talk to other systems. And then you build this, and here comes the problem. The moment you start building the hardware product, to get it into the hands of the users, these things come into play. Essentially, it's an issue with like having to push out the product to the supply chain, which is going to be your industrial designer. Uh, it could be your DFM service, which is designed for manufacturing. So something that um, helps you understand how to design your product so that it can be mass manufacturable, which you usually don't think of when you're building your prototype. And then you have an issue where you come into logistic problems because you have to physically ship the product to your you know, customers. And 
this is super hard. So to get to this pilot stage can take maybe three, six months. Then you go through the same cycle again, data, customer feedback, learn, and then you prototype again. The issue is there's three places here, um, which is prototyping and as well as you know the supply chain and logistic parts where you have extensive time and cost involved. That makes it super hard. So Tony Fadell in, in Bill basically says that on average a product takes about three iterations and nine to 18 months um, to actually be fully ready. Um, that's a pretty long time. So the two biggest issues, like I mentioned, is iteration time, iteration time and iteration cost. Um, but I want to leave this section with like a bit of hope. So the things that make hardware really hard is actually what makes it easy once it gets going. Because everybody else, like I said, is going to have the same issues. So it can be intimidating. So a lot of founders start off with something simple, like a mobile app. And counterintuitively, according to Jared Friedman, this is where it's actually easier to go with hardware sometimes. Because once it, you know, once it turns out fine, and once the product is ready, you have a really good story because it's so hard to build. Yeah. So the two questions we're going to try and answer in this next section is, how do you solve this time and cost issue? So how do you iterate or validate faster and cheaper, which is going to be like trying to pull it closer to like the lean startup model for, for software? Um, and how do you, if you can't do that, how do you raise funding so that you can actually build your product um, just with credibility, right? So you have to have somebody willing to give you money to build it if you can't build it fast and cheap, right? So we're going to talk about cold start hacks now. Um, the first thing is, if money is your problem, do things that don't cost money. Super simple, right? Yeah. Um, three really straightforward ways to do it is uh, visual representation or demos. Uh, then I'm going to talk about letter of intents, um, how to get them as well. Uh, and this weird thing here called board of advisors. How does that work? Um, so for visual representation, it's it's quite simple. There's maybe five to ten different ways to do it. This is mostly what I've found were relevant. Uh, you can have something like a concept video website landing page, specifically for if it's a hardware product. Uh, if you're doing a Kickstarter campaign, what would be great is if you have CAD drawings, because it just somehow gives you know a little more credibility that you actually thought the design through. Um, one of the things that hardware founders like to do is to create these plastic mockups. Mock um, mostly, those are designed to be like true field products, and this is important for like consumer electronics kind of. Uh, products because um, people want to know how they would look like and feel like when they're actually at their home, in their home environment, or if they're wearing them. So these plastic mockups come into play there. And the last thing, which I think is the best, um, especially if you're going for something which is a very hard engineering problem to solve, um, uh, it's, it's computer simulations to show that it actually works. This specifically works if it's uh, you know a biotech product, for example. So if you can show that the process works in computer simulations, at least you have some credibility. So I'm going to like very quickly go into what we did. Yeah. Yeah, my brother actually made this. He's a media design artist. So one of the things that you know simulations can do is if, if somebody, if you try and explain what you're building to someone, the most difficult thing for them is to understand what it looks and feels like, especially if something, if it's something so different that they've never seen it before, right? And uh, because all of us are like tech people, if I try to explain it to you, you guys probably understand. But if you try and explain it to like a five-year-old or, or your grandma, right? They're going to be like, what's a haptic vest? Like, why would you need one? Like. What is the thing, right? So when you show them and you're like, oh, OK, so like, you, get, you can feel these impacts that happen when you're like, you know, fighting in VR. She's probably going to be like, yeah, whatever. But at least she knows what it's doing, right? Um, so one of the things that this helps you do is um, 
it, it creates this credibility in a sense that you kind of know what you're building. Um, and now you're trying to raise funding to actually execute on this dream. So you're kind of like selling the dream, right? So this whole section is about like, how do you sell the dream so that you get money? What this also helps you do is the second part, which is get a letter of intent. So usually what a letter of intent is, is it's a non-binding contract. Um, usually from the person you are directly targeting as your customer. Um, and it sounds kind of weird that it's a contract but it's not really binding. But what it does is it shows your customer's intent in being able to purchase your product and it's actually pretty hard to get. Like people don't sign LOIs like, you know, left, right, and center. It's just super difficult to get. One of the reasons is because like if the LOI falls through, it kind of affects their credibility a little bit. Like if you are like dishing out LOIs. Um, and what the LOI along with the demo can do is like it can allow you to at least raise some funding from investors because it shows that there's some real demand for your product. So one of the mistakes that we made, and I wanted to make sure that I include this in this, um, in this section is there's a few things that you need to ensure when you're getting a letter of intent. You just don't, you don't want it to be like super generic. You want to make sure that the LOI has uh, requirements of what specific features that you need to build. Um, if the customer is willing to express what problems they have currently and how you can solve them in the LOI, that's even better. And finally, if you can, I know it's non-binding, but if you can, um, get a price. Like if they can tell you how much they're willing to pay, it gives the investors a context to what you know, the potential market size might be. Okay, so this is where the fun begins. Um, okay. Do you guys know who that is? <laughs> yeah, so this is Elizabeth Holmes um, and the Theranos. So one of the things you can also do, and I included, I specifically included this example, is because like I wanted to express how this can go wrong, right? Um, if you look at Theranos' board, it has a lot of big shots. What happens is when you have a board of people who are that powerful, essentially everybody just believes you, you know? You can have nothing and they'll just believe you, right? Uh, and that's where like strong advisory board comes into play. So if you have a mentor who's who's in the industry you're trying to go into, uh, or if you can you know lock onto somebody like please like that'll help you raise, mo raise money. Uh, one more. <laughs> uh, you guys know who this is, right? Yeah, we were guy uh, Adam Newman. Um, yeah, do you know his new company raised 350 million in funding? You guys know that. It's, it's not a typo, it's millions. Okay. Uh, and from Anderson Horowitz as well. It's, a, it's an M, it's not a K. Um, yeah, and then I have a slide note which tries to describe what it's like doing and I don't even know what it's doing. So if you, if you want, I can read it out to you. So it's like first, um, Flow is a technology first property management company handling day-to-day -day operations. Second, uh, it's a real estate asset management company that owns buildings. Third, it's a financial services company. And fourth, okay, this is the best one. This mechanism that is going to take some value and share it with its value creators. Okay. If you guys understand what that means, please explain it to me as well, because I don't get it. Um, and you can still raise 350 within funding. So, yeah. So essentially what, what happens is, um, these are like, basically like outlier examples, but if you have some form of credibility in terms of the people who are on your company, because Adam Newman has a, some form of credibility as a founder previously, arguable, but uh, that pretty much helped him raise this, this funding, right? Um, so yeah, if, if nothing works, this, this is one way you can go. Uh, just, just promise something, uh, you know, moonshot, and yeah, try your luck. Maybe. Oh, nepotism? Yeah, something like, you know, your uncle is about to get in, he'll like, you know, give you the money and then you get this. Right, right, yeah. 
So in this case, it doesn't even have to be someone related to you. If you can get in touch with like mentors who, who are powerful enough, you can still like they will open doors for you. Basically, it's not it's not a way that I recommend to to raise um, specifically because um, if you promise something that you can't execute, you're gonna hurt your reputation as well, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So even with uh, FTX as well, you know, a lot of, you know, yeah. So with FTX as well, like, if you see um, the, the funds that invested in, they basically followed, like, lead funds who they thought did their due diligence, and they just, just followed, right? So a lot of times, like, investors kind of sometimes tend to behave like, like sheep. It's like you get one, and then everybody starts pulling in. Yep. Because you got some big name, everybody's following you. Yep, exactly. Yep. So the better way to do it is something like this. So this is specifically um, catered towards biotech products, but there's an electronics example as well. So if you are trying to build something, you can first build a scaled-down version of it. Um, in this case, this is a uh, biotech company, Solugen, which are I think they're doing um, genetically engineered organisms, if I'm not wrong. So this is their 2016 scale down model, which is basically a beaker, which is about this big. Um, and then that's the full scale plant in 2022, which is definitely not as small as that. Um, so this is one way to do it. So you're trying to prove the principle, uh, and you're trying to get credibility this way. This is definitely better than Board of Advisors. Um, OK, you, you guys know this guy. Anybody want to take a guess? I will, right? So this is, OK, that's my pointer. My pointer doesn't want to be so low, so. The video doesn't want to play in frame, so I'm gonna. No That's the audio for his video. But the video is not playing, which is weird. So let me just go back. Let's see if it plays out of frame. <laughs> yeah, so the hardware equivalent. Um, well, electronics equivalent of, of a scaled down model is an under featured model. So you're basically just demonstrating essential features. Um, this was the first prototype where he's actually demonstrating like it's sending SMSs. So if you actually know, Pebble started off as a company that was different. I think it was called Impulse, and they were trying to send messages via Arduino to these remote devices, but they were actually designed to be mounted on bikes because Eric wanted to be able to read his text messages while he was on his bike, All right? Super dangerous, but hey. Um, yeah. So he just goes hack some <laughs> open source. If you, you'd laugh even more if I actually played the music, but anyway. It's pivoting towards a watch now, I think, yeah. This is probably 2013, 2014. Oh, watch being oh, okay. Yeah, watch being off. Showing off the board. Yeah, let me just go through again. Yeah. So let's talk about where Pebble started, and you're going to see a few of these um, timelines in this presentation now. The dead, yeah, yeah. So Pebble started 2008. Um, 2009 was the initial prototype, which is actually, like I said, like designed to be mounted on bikes. Um, 2012 is when they redesigned for the watch form factor because they ended up talking to a lot of. So from the bike. 
market, they ended up meeting a lot of fitness enthusiasts, and they ended up talking to a lot of fitness, people who are in fitness, and then they realized that, oh, an activity tracker kind of smartwatch might actually be a market, rather than putting it on a bike. Um, then um, they went into Y Combinator, and they actually failed to get funding. Um, so after they you know, failed the UI Combinator round, um, they started working on, on Kickstarter. And through Kickstarter, they raised 10 million. And if you look at the timeline from, from here to there, it's like four years. And you, you kind of look at like these examples as like overnight successes, but they were playing around for like four years. And I'll come to that again later as well. And um, same year that year, they raised another 10 million from, from VC round. So from failing to get funding um, in the same year, this is probably early 2012, um, to having 20 plus million in the bank at the end. Right. So some things about Pebble that, that were super interesting was they initially started off bootstrapped. So this is possible to do if your product is relatively lean um, or, or if you have somebody who's willing to pay you enough to, to bootstrap. Um, in, in Eric's case, it was somewhere around, it's still, I think, high five figures. Um, the cool thing is um, the fact that they manufactured their first 700 units by hand, that's actually a lot. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in the next example when, when I talk about doing things that will not scale, right? So you can start off uh, when you're converting hardware from, you know, a prototype to a product by doing things that will not scale along the way. Um, six weeks after the failure, they, were, they started working on, so six weeks together after the failure, they started working on the Kickstarter campaign and then they launched. Um, the cool thing was, um, and we'll come back to this when I look at the Kickstarter prototype, uh, they already had email subscribers pre-launch. So they were not launching like an unknown product in an unknown market, they knew that there was some form of demand already because they had built these units by hand. And that's super important. Um, they created the campaign material in-house, which is kind of standard sometimes these days for Kickstarter. And this was a hack. Like they had a press release the day before the launch. I think that probably created the most, um, most traffic for them. Um, this is Eric's advice. Um, Basically, he feels that you should do maybe like 10, 50, or 100 units of your product by hand, the way he did it, just because you want to get feedback. So all about like running lean. One of the things you can't you know, do early stage for hardware is push the product out and get it manufactured by a professional manufacturer, because that cycle um, will take a long, lot longer, and it'll also cost you a lot more. So if you have the expertise in-house to at least build a functioning prototype, that goes a long, long way in, in your ability to execute. Um, and coming and extending upon like, the fact that you should do like, things that don't scale, um, have you guys, has anybody been to Sandbox? Uh, they have a outlet in Orchard, actually. So Sandbox's story is super interesting. So it was founded in 2016 uh, in Hong Kong by Stephen Chow. In 2018, one of the first things that they did was they bought off-the-shelf hardware, um, and they hard-coded their software just to get the demo because they were running out of money. Then the next hack was they rented out like this really cheap, secluded place in Hong Kong where there was no food traffic because that's the only one they could afford. Um, and their hack was they actually got in front of people uh, using word of mouth like viral videos and they got fully booked. So what they were doing was they were encouraging people to come into their experience, um, record, like they were recording those videos and they were giving it to the people, like the processing and giving it to people and making them share it on social media. So they hacked the virality aspect of it um, in, a, in a really cool way. Uh, and actually that got them traction. But then what happens is 2019, pandemic, right? Just when you're getting traction, they lose 110% uh, revenue because they lost 100% because everything was closed and then they had to refund whatever was remaining, right? So they go into chapter 11 bankruptcy and they had to lay off, I think 80% of the staff at that point. 
Okay, and then this is the point of conviction for Steven. He puts in 200K, his whole life savings. Um, this is 2019 towards the end. Uh, and then what turns out was they knew that that product, that their experience had demand, right? So they end up surviving the pandemic. The moment things open up, they start getting traction again, and VCs catch on. And in 2021, there is 68 million. Yeah. So I specifically mentioned this story because like, this is the most extreme example of uh, hacking that I could find in, in this context. Like, it's, it's crazy. Like, going from bankruptcy to within two years raising a 68 million round is, is pretty insane. OK, third thing. Um, Raising funding using a POC. So the difference between what we saw earlier and a POC is um, at least initially you were demonstrating like prototypes. In POC, you're only dem demonstrating like a concept or a principle, uh, and you're generating money off of that. So one example was this yeah, EF company, uh, Transcelestial, if you guys have heard of it. Um, they demonstrated this uh, laser communications principle when, when they were in, in EF. Uh, and I hacked this from their EF pitch. <laughs> I literally took a screenshot of the YouTube video. So they sold this really impressive vision. It's like you start off with ground communications and then higher altitude has build and eventually satellites. Uh, and they claim that their technology was 1,000 times faster than the status quo. Usually like 10x is good enough and they're claiming like 100x, right? So just demonstrating the principle and good sales. Right? Yeah, um, but they're, they're quite impressive. Um, they have the Centauri now, the Centauri, uh, in, in market, I think. So, so this, is one, this is one way to do it. And then another example is this company called Astranis. Um, they do geostationary communication satellites. And as you can imagine, a satellite like this is not cheap to build, um, costs maybe hundreds of thousands to tens of millions, depending on the size. So they started off with this very demonstrable like nano satellite example, which is about 50K. Again, um, proved that the concept, the communications concept that they had was working. Uh, they built it in three months, and yeah, uh, they raced from there. OK, number four. Um, I think this is relevant. Um, so scalable side businesses is specifically relevant for companies whose main product takes exceedingly longer to get to market, but the same technology can be deployed in a way where you can have leaner market entries. So one example would be, let's say there was a company that was developing genetically, genetically engineered bacteria for agricultural pest control. So they clearly have uh, technology for gene editing, right? Um, or at least genetic engineering. So what they could do is uh, you could have a side business where you actually use the same tech for gene sequencing, um, and you can sell the data. You can sequence a genome, and then you can sell it to people. right? Uh, secondary uh, application could be genetics-based diagnostics. So if you guys have like, seen the genetic tests available, they could provide a service like that. right? So the advantage of like, doing a scalable side business is you are leaner and faster to market. You're helping like generate revenue while your main technology matures, and this is your big play, right? Okay, so final one, and this is where we come back to Kickstarter, um, is the sell it before you make it um, concept. Uh, so Kickstarter, Indiegogo, probably the two most important platforms when you kind of think of this concept, but. Uh, for sell it, to you, sell it before you make it, what you can actually do is you can get a pre-contract from um, you know, your end customer as well. It doesn't, even, it doesn't have to be like a crowdsourcing platform. Uh, crowdsourcing specifically works for consumer products, but this same concept can actually work for B2B products as well. So you can have a pre-contract. But for, for the sake of this uh, discussion, like for simplicity, I'm only going to touch on Kickstarter and of course, when you talk about Kickstarter, you have to talk about Oculus. Um, so Pamela Aki was 16 when he built the first prototype, 16, right? Uh, 2009, Pamela Aki builds the first prototype for the VR headset. 
The crucial breakthrough that these guys have is when Pablo meets um, John Carmack. So John was the creator of Doom, and he was he was a hobbyist in in the sense that he was super interested in VR tech. Like he was interested in immersive experiences. What he does is um, Palmer's headset impresses him so much that he's like, oh, I'm going to demonstrate it at um, E3. So he goes, uh, he creates a VR version of Doom for uh, Palmer's headset, and he demonstrates the Oculus at E3. Right? So the great hack here was powerful, important person, but in a good way in this case. <laughs> so um, influential people help. And he wouldn't have gotten this otherwise, right? Like, who, who in the world would have like developed like a high-end game for you know a headset that somebody just built in their garage, right? Um, then, um, 2012, later that year, they go Kickstarter and they have a 240 target. Uh, they raised 2.4 million, um, pretty impressive. And then, two billion um, Facebook acquisition two years later, like exponential. But it's super impressive, like you're 16, man. OK, so one of the important things that I want to like mention here is there's two ways you can go about with the Kickstarter, Indiegogo, cloud sourcing platforms. The first way is um, use it as a pre-sales or, or a funding for an early stage idea where you don't have the product. And you're basically using uh, you know, like a demonstration or a, or a really crude prototype. Um, or even like um, like I mentioned before, like a true feel plastic model um, to kind of try and raise funding to actually build the product. This can work, but there's another way to do it, and we'll see that later. So um, what happens in this case usually is you will end up underestimating costs specifically because you've never built the product actually, right? Um, the other thing is this naturally creates like less credibility with the backers because they're they're not sure whether you're going to be able to deliver on you know, the execution plan. Like everybody has ideas. It's, like, it's super difficult to execute them. Um, and the main thing that you probably saw with um, both the examples like we saw before, especially with, with Pebble, was they had an existing community. Like they had um, a lot of email subscribers who they knew wanted to use their product. You don't have that if you go this way. So what's the better way of, of um, going about like crowdfunding? Um, use it as a marketing channel or a go-to-market strategy. So what I mean by that is you already have a existing built product. You have validated it in the sense that you know there's a, at least a niche group of people that want to really use it. And then you use that um, as a baseline, and then you use Kickstarter to basically push you know, it out to the masses. Right, so you're raising money to actually manufacture rather than to actually develop, like like in this case. Yeah, so both examples, like Oculus and Pebble, both both did that. So I think this is riskier, and if you look into hindsight, this is probably better. Yeah. So just recap: um, five main ways so you can ha hack hardware. Um, First one is things that don't cost money, advisors, um, uh, demo simulations. Um, second is you can have a scaled down or under featured V1, um, or some aspects of, of the first version which may not scale. So you hard code stuff, you hack existing hardware even, you can build, you can get off the shelf stuff, you can hack it, modify it to your purpose, ship it, right? Um, and then third one is uh, proof of concept or proof of principle. This is specifically applicable if um, the product that you're trying to build has a very heavy MVP. So if the MVP is costing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you're very unlikely to be able to raise that kind of money. So then you show a concept or principle, and then you try and raise based on that. This usually comes with a, a catch that sometimes your credentials, like, um, having someone on your on your team with an advanced degree sometimes helps in the, in this context because you're basically it's it's very deep tech, and they kind of investors kind of want to see that credibility on the team. But uh, that's one way to do it. Um, scalable side business. Um, if your product like takes maybe 
more than 18 months to get to market, and you can use the same technology to solve some other problem, which maybe other people can't even do, then side business to fund the main business is a, is a viable strategy. Um, number five, uh, said it before you make it, so Kickstarter, Indiegogo, direct to like B2B or direct to whoever your customer is, that kind of sales. Uh, really quickly going to touch on hardware business models. Um, probably just going to run through these. Um, mostly to just get an understanding of how people scale their ecosystems eventually. Uh, first one is super simple. Uh, you have a device and you sell the device and its accessories. So camera, everything that goes along with the camera. Simple business model. You have high margins on the camera. You have high margins on, on the accessories. Uh, you make money on everything, right? Probably the most simple model. Second one is um, a lock-in model. So you probably heard of the razor blade model or loss leader model. This is this. Um, if you see a printer, uh, it usually is low margin. It's a loss leader. Uh, where the companies really make money out of is cartridges. This is why they're expensive. That's, that's the money maker. Um, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So that's that's the whole point. It it will exactly. So it's like that's the whole point. It's like we guarantee you won't use anyone else because you can't. <laughs> that's the whole point. That's the business model. Um, so with with razor blades, at least like um, people can hack the attachment, and you could probably make it. You will infringe on the patent for Gillette, so Gillette will come and sue you. Um, so there's already some projects where you can just have a different kind of razor. Yes. Which is probably better than what all these supermarkets already just Yeah, the, uh, there was a company that was selling that in Singapore, I remember, I forgot what their name was. I think they went out of business. Yeah, but yeah, you were right. Like People are trying to do that because um, they understand that the reason it's called the razor blade model is because actually Gillette came up with it, um, and pe people are trying to like you know fight against that monopoly because everybody uses Gillette razors and then everybody has to buy Gillette cartridges and nobody else makes money, right? So yeah, this this is a it, it works like it's it's a business model. Um, so there's there's another part to it and that's the ecosystem model. So. Best example is uh, Apple, right? So it's like, it's kind of like we're compatible with everyone else, kinda, <laughs> kinda. Yeah. Exactly, that's the whole, that's the idea, correct. So, Right, so in this case, it's like um, the software is also integrated across, right? So everything on all of your Apple devices will sync probably much better than it syncs across like platforms, right? So what, what, what they're doing is uh, it's, it, it actually helps the person who builds the ecosystem a lot because guaranteeing compatibility with your own products means that it's super easy for you to build your software. And if it kind of works with other stuff, you're, you're, it's good enough. But you can guarantee that it always works with stuff in your ecosystem, right? And it just makes it super, like, simple to to develop it versus, let's say, like Android, right? You, why do you have so many like bug patches on Android? Exactly. Yeah. So, firmware changes, right? Um, so many different things that change based on manufacturer as well. So, if you have something with your like standardized like processes. Both hardware and software that standardize it, it really helps. So it's still not even the case because Apple may have the advantage, but it also depends on how active they are. Because if they're passive on it, then the bugs will just you know drag on. For sure, yeah. And then like there's a lot of news where Apple like the exports are cheap, you know, so like you just buy and hack them. Yeah, yeah. For sure, I think um, one of the things is like like you said, the product has to be good enough for the ecosystem to work, right? So, yeah, Android, I use Android, 
because for me it's like pricey, like, and I like to hack my Android phone, like go developer mode, yeah, which yeah, Apple can't do. Right, exactly. So it's like appears to a different kind of community as well. But for most people, like I would say, like this is like the most idiot proof. Like you have to be re really, really like it's really hard to break, right? Um, this is like more recent um, device plus, plus digital content is is like best example. Yeah. So PlayStation, PlayStation exclusives, especially if you want to play the exclusives, buy a PlayStation. Um, there's this uh, console called Ouya. I don't know if you guys heard of it. <laughs> it died. Yeah. So they were they were trying to get these console games. Uh, sorry, like. Um, handheld portable games to like a console which could plug into your TV, but the console was portable because it was really small. So like they had like Final Fantasy and stuff, which was like, yeah, it was available on a console that you could like take across like to your friend's place very easily and just plug it in. Just died because it ended up being, a lot of the games were indie, and I guess the market for portable indie games was not, was not that, it's not great. Yeah. So yeah, this is also a loss leader. Um, PlayStation, uh, Sony makes most of their money on, um, you know, the revenue that they generate from like taking cuts on on the sales on the games, right? Um, uh, this one's <laughs> <laughs> yes, the asterisk is for data privacy. Um, so yeah, do, don't don't do this unless you know what you're like like get a lawyer, okay, before you do this. <laughs> Like literally, <laughs> you should get a lawyer. Um, so I'm not I'm not claiming any of these devices sell your data, just for the record. Uh, but this is potential. Um, so let's say you have a wearable. Um, you can monitor uh, health statistics. You can give give data to let's say insurance company. So let's say insurance companies charge a premium based on what risk it is. What risk there is to them that you will end up claiming their premium, right? So if you notice that premiums as you get older, if you start your insurance policy later in life, it, the premiums are higher. That's because you're going to pay them for less duration and there's a higher chance that you will actually trigger the policy, right? So getting somebody's health data and sending it to an insurance company would allow the insurance company technically to customize premium, but, you know, it's legal. Yes, so the business model for the insurance company is basically, it's probabilities, right? Yeah, so, it's not really, it's more like just <laughs> <laughs> with probabilities, yeah. yeah. So it's more like not probabilities, it's just, it's just to give them an uh, excuse to say, oh, we cannot do this because they got all the information. That's also true, <laughs> yeah. So you could sell, uh, in theory, data to, let's say, insurance company or health agency, um, smart devices. Do you ever feel like all your smart devices are always listening to you? I, I think the future is still more of what <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I, I put a benign example here, but you could do a lot of different things with the information that you could have from, from smart devices. So let's say, um, let's say there's a, you know, a forest fire. Um, you could have smart devices pick up information regarding particulates or smoke in, in the area so they could decide how the fire was progressing and notify the fire department, for example. Um, and uh, agencies would pay for that because um, in this case, it um, prevents a lot of damage to infrastructure, for example. Um, insurance companies would pay for it because it helps, you know, their like adjust their probabilities in a way that their business model is more profitable. So data's, data can be sold in many different ways. Um, you guys probably have seen like uh, the great hack, right? Cambridge Analytica, let's not go there, but yeah. Um, so final one, I put this in because I thought this was super interesting and probably relevant to this group here. Uh, do you guys know how open source hardware like Arduino make money. Right. 
OK, so this is super cool, though. So essentially, you can, I'm going to call it like genuine Arduino, like genuine, you know, right? So let's say, let's say you have this genuine Arduino, which is like expensive. You have engineers and devs who want to use it. Engineers, because it helps them like build their prototypes, which is what hardware hackers like kind of do, right? Because it helps you get like a proof of concept out very quickly. Uh, and then there's devs who are like developing libraries for this um, genuine Arduino. The thing with open source hardware, like Arduino is like the hardware is open source. So anybody can duplicate it and they can use cheaper components or cheaper manufacturing to, to replicate it, right? So you can have a Arduino not so genuino. Um, but what that does is it attracts a group of devs and engineers who would normally be not able to access this ecosystem just because the price point is lower. So it might seem like not a great idea to like open source hardware because now anybody can make it. Uh, and let's say this costs 30 bucks, that costs like six or seven, right? And you're like, ah, oh, how is Arduino in making money, right? So the key point here is like, the fact that they're attracting this extra ecosystem is actually reinforcing the libraries. What, what it does is like, now if you have more accessible like pieces of code which everybody can use, it creates a value in the ecosystem whereby more people will end up going and buying Arduinos and then some of those will be the people who buy genuine Arduinos because you know, they can afford it and they wanna pay for the quality. So the true value creation in this ecosystem is actually the software, the libraries, and the hardware being open source is attracting more people who build the software which help them sell more hardware. It's like super interesting, yeah. So quick touch up on business models again. Um, the lock-in or ecosystem model. Then there's a digital content model, uh, selling data. Shoot them out the asterisk again. Uh, open source hardware and selling accessories. Um, yeah, so it basically covers most of it for my presentation. If you guys wanna read up, and this, these are the books I recommend. Specifically, this, this one reads like a textbook, but it has most of the information that you would probably need if you want to ever like start a hardware company. So yeah, if you have questions, like shoot questions. That's it, thank you. Uh, so out of the five business models, which one does your company adopt? Right, so <laughs> right now we're in a, in a middle of trying to figure out what we do and the reason why we are going for the, you know, the Lego of haptics kind of concept is because we want to go this way, but not not lock in, but more of an ecosystem. So we are not technically going to be open source, at least that's not the plan right now. But we want to create um, this platform of products which can integrate with each other. Uh, the reason for that is when we talk to our end users, what they told us specifically was one of the things that lacks with uh, haptic devices in the market right now, especially like the thing which you're looking at now, which is gloves, is that specific types of gloves work really well for specific applications, and they don't have features to fit into other applications. So let's say you wanna like feel the texture of an object, you need something which jams your, you know, jams your joint. So let's say I'm pressing into a virtual object, it'll lock my joint, and it'll prevent me from pushing into it, right? That's how I feel stiffness. Um, if you want to do something which is more dexterous, like surgery, you need some form of feedback on your palm. Um, but you might not need that for other applications. So the idea behind like creating a modular ecosystem is that people can add and remove components as they want based on their application, which is what lacks in the in the current like so ecosystem. Are you building a unified sensor platform? Sorry. Are you building a unified sensor platform? Uh, it's not a sensor platform. It's more of a output actuator platform. We do have one sensing technology, which we might end up using for gesture-based control. Uh, but again, it will be like an adder, addable or removable module. Is, is this like those uh, haptic vests or, you know, anything that gives VR checks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really a game, it's just it's just people to go and then yeah. just and then play VR and stuff. Yeah. Is this the developer facing or Ah, uh, this is, so our target is to reach 
our end users, but through a channel, which is the people who are developing these uh, AR, VR applications. So um, one of the things we realized very early was uh, we are really good at hardware, but we lack the capability of developing um, you know, the VR experience or AR experience in-house. So we're like, okay, um, let's, let's outsource that. Like, let's work with people who can build that. Uh, and what we can add to their you know, ecosystem is the ability to do haptics, which they normally wouldn't have, right? So it opens up more applications for them, and it um, takes out you know, the part that we might have had to build, which is not our expertise. So we'd have to uh, like, either outsource it or hire more people. We were initially like considering outsourcing it, and then the courts came back and were like, no, I can't afford it. Uh, yeah. So we're like, what's the leanest way to get out of this, right? So we are ending this session.